Hey, this is Blonde Guy Gamer, and welcome to another Black Sheep Game Review. And yeah, this did take forever to come out, I know, but I do have, uh, somewhat good reasons. I swear. Partly because last couple of years can be mentally draining on anyone, and partly because this game is a rough one. And I'm not saying that just to play up the old YouTube game reviewer gets angry at video game stick. It, no, I'm not exaggerating when I say this was one of the most grueling gaming experiences I forced myself to play through. Now you may be asking, but blind guy, why go through a game like this for a video? It was a Patreon request. This time from a good friend of mine who has done it for me before in the past, Tiger Ichimaru. She, being a big fan of the Elder Scrolls games, wanted me to do a spin-off, specifically an Elder Scrolls Legend Battlespire. Those of you that actually know about this game already have an idea for what's in store, but for everyone else, well, let's start with Elder Scrolls. Considering the massive success this series has had, you've likely at least heard of the Elder Scrolls games. If not, well, they're high fantasy open world action RPGs set on the fictional continent of Tamriel and its provinces. The first game, Arena, was released back in 1994 on DOS computers and there have been four other main entries since then. Daggerfall, Morrowind, Oblivion, and the most recent entry, Skyrim which is now over 10 years old. Don't worry, I feel just as old as all of you too. In 2018, an Elder Scrolls 6 did get announced, and that's pretty much it as of this video. It's uh, safe to assume 6 is still quite a ways away. Regardless, if you want some good open world RPGs to play, you can't really go wrong with Elder Scrolls for the most part. I like them, though I never get around to finishing any of them, mostly due to how big they are and getting sidetracked, both within those and other games I get distracted with. Despite that, I do see the qualities that earn the success they have garnered, even with the, shall we say, quirks the games and subsequently their developer, Bethesda, are often known for. They have become a pretty big name in the gaming industry thanks to the success of Elder Scrolls, Fallout, and many other games they have made and published. For better or worse. Yeah, I can't exactly deny some of the, uh, notoriety the company has gained. Even focusing on just Elder Scrolls with Skyrim alone, we've seen quite a few re-releases. From the Special Edition to the Nintendo Switch, VR, and even, albeit more of a tongue-in-cheek, choose-your-own-adventure narrative game, the Alexa. I ate all of the cheese. Hmm, am I forgetting one? Like, something more recent? Oh, right! The board game. Though that's not to say there haven't been any other Elder Scrolls games besides the Skyrim releases. There's Elder Scrolls Online, which I haven't played since I'm not too interested in MMORPGs, but heard it's fine and is still getting content. There's that card game that tried to compete with Hearthstone, did anyone actually play this? There's that mobile game that got ported to the Switch, and apparently has an egregious use of the pay-if-you-don't-want-to-grind structure. Thanks, mobile gaming markets. And, uh... Skyrim Pinball? Okay, it's pretty obvious there has been quite a bit of filler while we wait for Elder Scrolls 6, but it's not like Bethesda didn't do that in between main entries before. Because after Daggerfall in 1996, the first two spin-offs were made before Morrowind. Battlespire in 97, originally an expansion for Daggerfall but became a standalone game, and The Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard in 98, both on BC and both mostly forgotten, not highly regarded. While we are focusing on the former, I wouldn't be opposed to covering Redguard sometime after as it's also a clear contender for another black sheep in the series. Maybe I'll do that when Elder Scrolls 6 finally comes out, or whenever they actually reveal anything for it at this rate. And if I wanted to go even further, there are the Elder Scrolls Travel series of portable games for old Java phones and even the end gauge of all things, but I'll probably just stick to Battlespire and Redguard for now since those are easier to play and cover. Besides, Battlespire is the first ever Elder Scrolls spinoff and we should actually get to it at some point. Much to my dismay. I should reiterate that I am not going to be very nice to this game. I'll still try to be as fair as I can, but the frustrations will heavily weigh in here. I would even go as far as to say that this is the worst non-mobile Elder Scrolls game. Maybe even worse Bethesda-made game within their own franchises. Though the latter might be difficult to convince when the launch of Fallout 76 is still fairly fresh on everyone's mind. But it's when you dig deep into Bethesda's past is where you find games like Battlespire and realize... Oh. And if you dig too deep, that's where you find stuff like Home Alone or Where's Waldo on the NES. Which, yes, they did those before Arena and may arguably be the actual worst games Bethesda have made. But it doesn't really matter what is objectively the worst Bethesda game because I need to stop stalling and get the battle spy already, so let's go ahead and do that. If there is one thing I will give Battlespire, it's the box art. It's pretty dang good, like a sick metal album cover kind of good. However, box copies have always been pretty difficult and pricey to come by, but it did get a release on good old games in 2015, which is how I played it. 
So unless you want this cool looking box for PC game collection's sake, I'd settle on the GOG or the recently released Steam version since it is the easiest, don't have to set up a DOS box yourself way to play and officially buy the game, if you really feel the need to. Or if you just want the box, you could just stumble upon it like my friend Wanro did who just so happened to give it to Tiger Jamiro and thus I was able to film it during a visit. And if you are lucky enough to have this complete, I like to mention that it came with a letter from the founder and then president of Bethesda, Christopher Reaver, giving you the usual thanks for buying this spiel and that it pretty much confirms it is filler until Morrowind, which he says we can look forward to in late 1998. Morrowind didn't come out until 2002. Add that to the poorly aged things Twitter if it isn't already on there. Booting up the game begins with a narrator recalling how a hero overcame the titular Battlespire, an interdimensional training facility of sorts within the realms of Oblivion run by the Imperial Battle Mages, that got taken over by an army of Daedra, the demonic-like forces of the series, led by the Prince Lord Mayrunes Dagon. They were able to do so thanks in part to the betrayal of Battle Mage Jaegar Tharn, who longtime Elder Scrolls fans will recognize as the antagonist from Arena. We then go to the opening credits and through the wonders of compressed FMV computer graphics see sweeping shots of the battle spire while a dancer woman kills some people and raises her weapon to pose for the cover art in victory. It then cuts to an altar where the purposely obscured for character creation protagonist is being transported to the battle spire for their final test, not knowing it got invaded by the Deatra. After that we get to the main menu which, <laughs> you will see a lot in this game, trust me. Starting a new game goes to creating your character and the game window suddenly shrinking with these PowerPoint presentation-like pop-ups that give you help, but prove to be an overbearing way to give tutorials. Thankfully you can't stop these from automatically popping up, though you may want to read these to get some understanding on how to play this if you don't want to read through the manual. Now when it comes to characters I play as in Elder Scrolls, I tend to make one of three types. A Nord Warrior based on myself if I'm feeling uncreative, a Kashyyyk Rogue based off of my cat Roly, or a female Dark Elf spell sword with an old, abstract character name I made up to sound alien for a short sci-fi story I wrote back in my aspiring fictional writer phase that was my original channel name in the ancient YouTube days before changing it, Jaquelta. I only bring that name back for characters in fantasy RPGs like these nowadays. So first choice is race, which do have different bonuses depending on what you pick. Well, we can't be Kajik or the Reptilian Argonians in this, because they can't join the Battle Mages, I guess. Or in my head canon, Jagar Tharn won't let them in because he's racist. Since I've only been my spell sword character in Morrowind so far, I'll go with Dark Elf and Female. Oh. So, uh, yeah, there's nudity in this Elder Scrolls game. Surprise! Now, there was also nudity in Daggerfall, believe it or not. Albeit a little more out of the way in that you had to take off your character's clothes from the inventory screen or solo upon certain women NBCs and Daedra characters. While in Battlespire, it's more gratuitous with seeing it immediately in the character creation if you pick a female, and even if you don't, there are prominently topless female characters you'll run into during the game. However, there's no explicit lower nudity, even on males in the character screens, as they get loincloths. Meanwhile, Daggerfall did have male nudity, even if it was Greek statue quality, but hey, points for equality there. Needless to say, it's pretty awkward and kind of unintentionally funny to sell upon this sort of thing in the older Elder Scrolls. It's like finding Bethesda's old nude drawings they made when they were teenagers. Apparently there is a child guard system in the original install options that eliminates nudity and other mature subject matter, with a password needed to turn it off. Though I don't know if there's even a way to enable that in the re-releases. I guess it was a way to make it more family computer safe, but I doubt it was used all that much. It was probably more likely someone walked in while this was on screen. I'm sure that would have been fun. After picking your character's appearance from a few hair, eye, and mouth selections, you can either select a class from a list or make a new custom class, much like the other Elder Scrolls. Though there's no questionnaire if you wanted to generate a class through roleplaying like in the first two games. Picking a new class has you make one from scratch and is similar to Daggerfall's custom class creation. How it works is that you select whatever primary, major, and minor skills your character will be most proficient at along with a base of 5,000 build points to spend on any additional values for attributes such as wounds for hit points, strength, intelligence, and so forth, limited to 75 at the start increasing skill proficiency percentages up to 60, spells you'll have, whatever equipment and items you'll start off with, and what advantages and disadvantages you can have, the last of which has quite a few options with a stipulation. You see, most advantages cost a lot of points, to where you likely can't afford the really good ones like health regeneration, but any disadvantages you select will give points back. That way you likely can't have huge advantages without at least some disadvantages. It's there to try to keep the character creation balanced, as all things should be I suppose. The problem is that it's not very flexible with advantages I would want without sacrificing stats or adding disadvantages for those point values, so I didn't really bother with these. I will give Battlespire props for having a robust creator character system, it's just hampered by basing on points in an attempt to expand on Daggerfall's custom creation. 
where in that it used simpler balance methods of adding and subtracting attribute points from base averages and needing more or less skill advancements for any advantages and disadvantages you select respectively. Using a points pool for Battlespire makes it a hassle to try and make exactly what you want. As a result, you may end up just selecting a class like I did, which gives you pre-selected stats, abilities, equipment, and advantages slash disadvantages depending on what you pick. I chose Spellsword for my Dark Elf and got a pretty standard setup. You are able to adjust everything here as well to fine-tune things, so that's nice. Though I kept my stats mostly at default. After all that, we can finally st- ah! And after reading those, if you still have them on auto, we can finally start playing. Er, hang on, let me change the controls into something that somewhat resembles a more modern control scheme. Okay, now we can get going. Oh jeez, the look sensitivity is way too high. Probably because of the small resolution it plays in DOSBox. I need to try and fix that. Oh, mouse speed affects look and cursor speed. That's fun. Alright, I think I found a study I can work with. We should be good. For real. So arriving at the Battle Spire puts our hero in immediate danger as the place is, of course, swarming with enemies. So we better make sure we have our equipment and such ready. Oh, for crying out loud, why do we start out naked? Is this just how the teleportation works? You can't wear anything while using it? Well, with the exception of males having loincloths. Clear priorities, after all. Anyway, equipping armor and weapons is much like the previous scenes in that you can either drag them over to your character or double-click on them in the inventory screen. Once you're equipped and ready, you'll naturally want to go up and attack some enemies, but quickly discover the combat is... very archaic. Granted, this is the old style of combat from the first two Elder Scrolls, where you hold the right mouse button and swipe in different directions for various melee attacks. But that's not even the most archaic thing about the combat. Because landing successful hits is skill check based depending on the combat oriented stats and skills of the player and enemies. Meaning you can miss several times if your rolls aren't high enough, even when they're right in front of you. Now, to players of older Elder Scrolls, especially Morrowind when you start out, this is nothing new. But if you are not familiar with this, chances are you will flail about when running into stronger enemies, barely get any hits in, and quickly die. Oh, and when you do die, you immediately get a game over scene followed by a hard reset of the game. Then you have to go through the main menu to reload a save. Uh, assuming you made one before you died. And considering how easy it is to die in this game, not just from enemies, you will see this game over and reset a lot. Going back to combat, it gets quite frustrating since you are at the mercy of the number generation. Even with decent stats and weapons, fights can go one of two ways. Either fairly quickly if you get lucky and land blows, or they drag on where you basically slap each other until one of you dies. Now, I do admit my main method of attacking boils down to running up while swinging wildly and alternating between different attacks, which is a bit of a detriment since the more powerful attacks are more likely to miss. So it always feels like no matter how much I try, I can never easily take down most enemies. Sure, you can argue challenge and role-playing aspects, but I am very glad Oblivion did away with this combat in favor of something much more conventional. Call me a filthy modern casual gamer if you want, I just prefer my Elder Scrolls combat to actually feel like I can take on something if I'm strong enough and not up to virtual dice rolls because it has to be like Dungeons and Durgans! At least in the other old Elder Scrolls, it does eventually get better the more your skills improve and stronger weapons you obtain. But in Battlespire, its difficulty curve is steeper, so it never seems like your attacks get much better. It's made even worse with mechanics like enemies being able to dodge and catch you off balance, that awkwardly slows your attack down and prevents you from attacking again for a short period. Or what is perhaps my most despised thing, a foe is being able to knock your weapon out of your hand, forcing you to clumsily pick it back up and re-equip it. It makes the already clunky combat even more aggravating. There are other attack options like spells, which you can assign hotkeys to. As a spell sword, I started off with two spells. One was cause damage, which, as the name suggests, is a damaging spell, but it didn't seem all that effective when I tried using it. Turns out it was because the spell was set to touch, and if I was going to be that close, I'd just use my sword. With spells like those, you can actually change the delivery method and type of magic. Kind of neat, but a little needlessly complicated for the exact magic you would want. I didn't figure this out until way later, so by then cause damage still didn't seem very useful. The other starting spell was shield that blocks an amount of enemy melee damage. I ended up pretty much relying on this in order to not die instantly when fighting anything remotely strong, provided I had enough spell points. Any additional spells have to be found from scrolls, though I didn't find very many, so I stuck with my defensive magic. And even if you don't have certain spells, there are potions that do corresponding effects, as well as some enchanted items you come across, the latter of which costs their durability when used. Another way of attacking is using projectile weapons like bows and arrows, which do work. Aiming isn't even really an issue since you have an icon appear when you are lined up for a shot. However, they are quite slow to fire and take forever to kill anything with. What's even slower is when you equip them on the secondary weapon slot and switching over to them takes a few seconds. Unlike in Daggerfall, while you could only equip two one-handed weapons, you could swap between them instantly. Sure, you can now switch between a weapon and a bow on the fly, but it's handicapped a bit too much. 
because by the time something I was shooting at would run up to me, I'd have to slowly switch back to my melee weapon and likely get hit in the process, so yeah, not fun. What's also not fun is getting around this game. Unlike the main Elder Scrolls with their open worlds of numerous towns and dungeons, Battlespire is level based, with seven of them to go through. While that doesn't sound like a lot, they are large sprawling areas that take a while to trek through. Adding to that are the objectives we'll need to do, which are usually finding MacGuffins and activating a number of things in each level. And if you do miss something, you'll likely need to backtrack, which you do at least have a map that fills in as you go. It's not ambitiously 3D to help with multiple floors like in Daggerfall, but at least in Battlespire it's not dungeon layouts that the devs were never told stop when making them. Even when you know where to go, it gets very tedious given the scale of the levels and meandering pace your character moves at with average speed stats. And there's no stamina bar in this entry, so there isn't a sprint function either. I did find some boots later on that let me run faster, in the second to last level, thanks game. What makes trudging through them even more of a hassle are needing this game's equivalent of key cards. Sigils you'll need to go through corresponding sigil barriers. Sigils are essentially magical amulets of the Daedric alphabet that you'll usually find off of enemies. But those aren't what get you past the barriers. Instead, you need to be on the lookout for matching sigils of entry, which look exactly like regular sigils. So if you don't realize this at first like I did, you'll get stuck for a bit not knowing you need a sigil that isn't depicted any differently other than of entry for its text. So you really need to pay attention to item names. And this problem of not being able to easily tell the same type of item apart really gets annoying the more stuff you have, even with being able to toggle off types of items to appear in the inventory. It's particularly bad with potions as they all use the same bald orange drink model, forcing you to scroll through every single one to find what you want to use or hotkey. Or when you go through multiple chests and sacks that are stacked or close together or even within themselves, the item management is a mess. It also doesn't help that trying to pick stuff up in the mouse view has no cursor to help you see where you click on. So there were times I just brought the cursor with a toggle, then you can more easily click on what you want. Doesn't make it any less awkward in these old Elder Scrolls though. Going back to those sigils, you really don't need to collect them besides the entry ones. Unless you want to use them to cast etherealness on yourself and raise the Thaumaturgy skill, or if you happen to have the same letter of sigil an enemy has, have a better chance to persuade them in your favor when talking to them. Yes, that is a thing in this game, but Shin Megami Tensei this is not. It is something you can do with all the enemies, but doesn't have a whole lot of practical purposes. First of all, they have to be willing to talk to you, so even with matching sigils on hand, it's not guaranteed you can initiate a conversation. Though they can be willing or even start the conversations themselves at times. Once talking, certain dialogue choices may convince them to not fight you and maybe even attack others. Otherwise, they pretty much just say no or deceive you, effectively wasting your time. And even when you are successful, they mostly just stand there, doing nothing. I guess it can be a tactic if you don't want to fight stuff, but you often need to kill specific enemies to get entry sigils and other things they drop regardless. It's just such a... superficial feature. So much so that I didn't try to talk to most enemies more than once after a while. I would only occasionally do so if they beckoned me, which either have them surrender or uselessly taunt me. Or it would happen by accident if I clicked on them. The only thing I can see getting out of this is all the dialogue you can have with them, some of which can be useful now and then while the rest offers some mildly interesting or amusing flavor text. And then there's some dialogue choices that are... well... One time a spider Deidre wanted to talk to me and offer me a... stimulating exertion. Now, this isn't my kind of thing, but my morbid curiosity got to the better of me to see what would happen if I did comply. Uh, okay, I put my sword down and he's not attacking me anymore. I guess we did it. Was it good for you at least? What really hammers in the fact you don't need to convince enemies to not attack you is that their overall AI can be just as much of a crab shoot. Sometimes they will be brain dead and not figure out how to get to you, being exploitable targets for ranged attacks. Other times they will relentlessly attack you and kill you in seconds, especially with enemies that throw spells at you non-stop, making them quite difficult if you don't have the means of dealing with that. Unless you get lucky and they kill themselves with their own spells, or friendly fire others. And there are times you can find them completely stuck in the level geometry, utterly helpless due to the questionable programming. Of course, the same thing can happen to you, don't mistake that, usually from the jumping. Oh dear god, the jumping. This is perhaps the most inept way I've seen jumping done in a 3D first person game. Jumping and its distance is dependent on how long you hold the button, which brings up an indicator that looks like an ice cream cone, or bugle chip for you lazy game review fans, that shows where you will jump to when you release the button. It's slow, clunky, and a pathetic way to do first-person platforming when other games have already figured it out by then. Hell, Turok that came out in the same year on the Nintendo 64 had better jumping than Battlespire. And if you aren't careful, you can end up jumping or falling into things where the game either just outright kills you, or you get completely stuck and have to reload to save. 
What's most baffling about this is that the previous Elder Scrolls jumping mechanics were not this bad. Even with Arena having you press the J key across gaps and Daggerfall's more conventional but realistically small jumping, they didn't heavily rely on them. But because Battlespire has more elaborate level designs with platform sections, I'm guessing Daggerfall's short hops didn't cut it. So they came up with... this as a way to ready up bigger jumps and show where you will land. Not a good choice in my humble opinion. And don't get me started if you need to go down from certain platforms. Because one time an elevator that brought me up went back down and wouldn't come back up for some reason. I tried using a potion of slow fall to prevent falling to my death, but you can't control your forward momentum and direction, so if you float into a wall or something, you'll get stuck and have to reload a save. Eventually, I gave up and reloaded a save before the lift, because all that was up there were health potions I would have had to use anyway after dealing with the enemies there and other things I didn't need. I think you can see why I got so frustrated with this game. Although I believe a lot of the frustration stems from the lack of options the previous games had. In Battlespire, there's no gold to collect, which is odd for a game like this, but I suppose there's no need for it in a training facility within the interdimensional voids of Oblivion. As such, there's no merchants to buy things from, so you have to rely on what you find. A lot of which are inferior weapons and armor you can't sell, so there's no point in hoarding everything. Especially since you do have a weight carry limit that's standard for the series. So other than the occasional better equipment or replacements because of durability, the only useful things to loot are potions, arrows, and maybe enchanted items. The last of which can be pretty vague on what they do and may have some interesting names now and then. Like the Thongs of Nightmares. I don't think I want to find out what those do. There are scrolls that list these, but it's still mostly a case of figure it out nerd and look up a giant list online, so I mainly stuck with things with recovery properties to try and survive on because there's no inns either, or any kind of rest option like in the other games for that matter. Instead, there's these sets of two crystals that you'll occasionally come across that restore HP and SP. Oh, and there's no shield in this game to equip, which could have helped to take less hits from everything. Leveling up in Battlespire is also different that you simply earn a set amount of build points after completing each stage. I suppose they did this to coincide with the level-based structure, but it's rather unintuitive compared to how Elder Scrolls usually does it. You still improve your skills the more you do actions like in all Elder Scrolls, though you need build points to increase attributes and effectively the max number of those linked proficiencies. Because of this, you may run the risk of spreading yourself too thin since you only have a finite amount of points to work with, which might have happened with me. Don't get me wrong, I still used a good amount of my points on improving my longsword, magic, and the appropriate attributes but did spend points on other things that may not have been as helpful. So I am willing to admit that may have been part of the reason why I struggled so much. Though I still think a lot of the issues come from the sporadic combat and the equally sporadic enemy behavior. That and you're pretty much forced to make a middling character from the start with only six level ups to optimally work with. It's also not very flexible when it comes to what classes actually work. Like, how would something like a thief work in this game? There's nothing to steal or lockpick into, and while there is a sneak function and backstabbing skill, good luck trying to do that with this enemy AI. All they would have going for them is high agility. A Night Elf spell sword seemed combat efficient enough to work with. I'm just wondering if I didn't do something right and made it harder on myself. Or it could just be the game is not bounced properly. Take your pick. But no amount of excuses can waver the technical problems this game has, because it is a bug-riddled mess. Now I know what probably all of you are going to say. Of course the game is buggy. It's a Bethesda game. It just works in other overused Todd Howard quotes. Okay, first of all, you actually can't blame Todd Howard for this. He is listed in the special thanks of Battlespire's credits, but was not directly involved with this game. It was before he even started directorial duties, which was actually the next game, Red Guard. So yeah, say the Todd Howard jokes because he is not responsible for this one. Though that likely won't stop you from making them anyway if you haven't already. Secondly, you may think you know what a buggy Bethesda game is, but let me be very clear on this. Housefire is a very broken and buggy game for Bethesda standards. I repeat, for Bethesda standards. Yes, Bethesda games, particularly the big open Elder Scrolls and Fallouts, do have their reputation for things not quite working as intended at times. But keep in mind, these are games with years of AAA development resources and people working on them. They're by no means perfect, but for the most part, people have enjoyed them despite those hiccups. Then there's Battlespire, an Elder Scrolls game with only one year of development, that was supposed to be a Daggerfall expansion until they decided to make it a full game, with less people and experience before the booming success of Morrowind, of which they were divided for for this game, Redguard and Morrowind, which resulted in the amount of beta testers greatly outnumbering those that actually worked on the game, so there's no way they could have fixed all the issues discovered before the deadline. And even with scaling the scope down for a level-based spin-off, it became clear that the team who worked on this prioritized on level layouts and not much else in terms of functionality. 
A lot of what I have shown so far is mostly the result of mechanics not aging well or just being wonky in general. However, the amount of issues that can and did happen to me is staggering, even when you are expecting them. Like the game crashing, which, let's be real, is practically hard-coded in every mainline Bethesda game to do so now and then. But in Battlespire, it's even more unstable and can crash for a number of reasons. Like with these coffers of restoration, a one-time use coffer that restores an item's durability, that crashed the game the first time I used one, or when I tried to enter this building through the chimney. Luckily, those are the only major game crashes I've had, but plenty of other things did happen. One time, I couldn't pick up a gem that was on the floor for a while, and even when I could click on it at first, it showed nothing on the item screen to collect. I've had enemies clip into walls or just get stuck in general like I mentioned before, a level where the music didn't play at all, armor I couldn't equip or re-equip even though I thought they were within my armor class, unless it had something to do with specific pieces I couldn't wear because heavy armor is forbidden as a spell sword? I don't know, if it's not glitched, this is just weirdly convoluted. That is part of the fun of this game, guessing whether something is bugged or just clunky. Though there were things I could clearly tell were bugs, one of the biggest I encountered was falling right through the level and into the Void of Oblivion. I'm more surprised this didn't happen more than once for me. And while these are more so visual glitches, they are still worth noting, like my equipped sword in the inventory screen disappearing, or the sky turning black would load into a level and entering water or buildings would revert it back to its normal blue. Speaking of this level, it's where the most severe game-killing bug can happen. On the fifth level of Biospire, loading a save game here after every reset causes object entries to be made or in other words, increase the size of the save file. And if it reaches a certain point, the save won't be able to load due to it not being able to allocate object memory. Normally, it takes somewhere between 30 to 50 restart loads for this to happen, but considering the amount of times you can die and the game resetting every time you do, it may not take long for the overflow to happen and the save effectively getting corrupted. Fortunately, I knew about this before playing. So I backed my saves and used a workaround that I read up within the unofficial Elder Scrolls Pages entry for Battlespire, which also provides some good resource material for this video. In order to mitigate the extra object creation, you need to load up a save in a previous level after every boot up. Save over that, then load up the level 5 save. It adds to the tedium to do this every time you die in that level, yes, but at least you'll greatly reduce the time it would take to lose your saves and thankfully I didn't. Still, to have this much of a game-breaking bug and never gotten a fix is peak Battlespire. And this is the patched 1.5 version that's on GOG, by the way. I can only imagine how stable the 1.0 version was back when downloading patches weren't very accessible. And there isn't much of any fan-made patches or fixes to address, well, most of the things in this game. It says a lot when the Terminator FPS games from Bethesda, which Todd Howard actually did work on, that I didn't even know existed until I saw Civ 11s video on it gets an unofficial community-made patch, while this Elder Scrolls spin-off pretty much gets abandoned. I think a factor of what goes wrong in Battlespire is because this is a game from 1997 running in DOS and that they were pushing their game engine, the X-Engine, a little too hard. Yeah, Bethesda being overly ambitious and pushing their limits. Shocking, I know. Some things never do change. X-Engine was used for Daggerfall and even those aforementioned Terminator games and was fine for mid-90s 3D capabilities, but by 97 it was already outclassed by other then and upcoming PC games. Not to mention it runs in software mode with no 3D effects support. That didn't stop them from trying to add on to Daggerfall's build with more fleshed out environments. Well, as much as they could with those limitations. As such, things don't look quite as good as intended. Like this chain mechanism that straight up looks like a strand of anal beads. Even if LGR didn't say that in his video, I'm sure everyone would still call it those. Then there's instances of 3D interactive elements that can backfire on you if you aren't careful, such as this lever that opens a wall to get to something, but can hit and may even kill you. D really? Like, what, was I supposed to activate it from the side so I wouldn't hit myself? Because, sure, that's what you would do in a real situation, otherwise this happens. Oh. <laughs> but you wouldn't think this would smack you the first time you come across this in a game, and god, it's only in this part of a single level, but it's so bewildering, I just... How do you go from Daggerfall to this? Although one distinct upgrade this does have over Daggerfall is that weapons and items are no longer sprites. They are fully modeled, albeit limited to one type each that leads to the problem of not telling them apart easily. Though enemies and characters are still 2D, with being sprites in-game and slightly more animated renders in the dialogue screens. Keeping them primarily 2D was a choice made by designer and lead programmer Julian Le Fay. And to the artist's credit, they are decently detailed, though I can think of two real reasons why they stuck with them. Okay, no, it's actually because Julian prefers sprites over polygonal models. A wise choice, as there are dead bodies that are polygonal and they look... Uh, yeah, there's no way this game would have been able to animate models like those well. Sure, the Terminator games managed to do it, but those kind of polygonal models worked as robotic enemies. 
Not so much for the designs in Battlespire, unless you want hideously blocky models of them. The rest of the 3D visuals, while also pretty primitive even for the time, do have a low poly style that I can see maybe charming indie devs into trying to replicate for their throwback game. Too bad it doesn't run super well, although that's usually when you have the graphical setting on high. On low, it does run smoother, but with less detailed visuals. You know what that reminds me of? The N64 expansion pack compatible games. Because a lot of those had an option to pick between high and low res graphics, with high often having sharper visuals at the expense of choppier frame rates. Really puts the whole PC Master Race into perspective when this is performing like an N64 game, huh? Okay, it's not as bad as that, but it's not very smooth either. I did mostly play the game on high graphics with the cursor menu on the HUD minimized, and I tolerated the frame rate, though it did chug at times, especially in bigger areas. And I'm pretty sure it was like this on original recommended hardware, so I wouldn't say this is because of the GOG version running on DOSBox. However, there was one issue that I'm not sure if it was because I played this version in full screen while recording, or if it's just like that in the first place. Another fun guessing game. There were times the cursor would just not be there when going back to the main menu, usually after dying several times to an enemy I got hung up on, and I couldn't select anything. So I had to stop my recording, force close the game, and relaunch it every time this happened. And I had to do this a lot, because I died a lot, because this game isn't fair. A good chunk of my recordings are just 5-10 to 10 minute clips of me dying to the same enemies over and over until the menu cursor disappeared and I had to start a new one. And when you add in all the bugs and archaic gameplay and having to work around not losing your saves for an entire level and enemies being able to destroy you so quickly, and you have a game that pushed my patience to its absolute limit. I'm not being hyperbolic just to make cheap shots at Bethesda for views, it really was that much of a slog. And I played through the entire game, with no cheats or anything like that. Because I didn't really know how to, but the point still stands. I wouldn't even say it's worth getting to the end story-wise, because... You know what? Before I get into that, is there anything else I actually did like in Battlespire? Well... The music is not bad. Certainly fits the forbidding atmosphere of the areas. They just tend to add to the monotony of the long levels after a while, and will sometimes not loop right away. The voice acting is also not too bad. All of the enemy and NPC dialogue is fully voiced, so that's pretty surprising. What isn't is that you can tell it's all performed by the staff, presumably. So the quality is a bit all over the place and pretty corny at times, but not the worst out there. Though I did get a kick out of some voices, like this one who I can only describe as Midwestern Deidric Mom. Goodness, where did you come from? I thought we'd done all the guards and the battle mages on the list. And honestly, calling her that makes it more interesting than the actual characters and story in this game. That's not to say there isn't anything going on narrative-wise in Battlespire, far from it. There's plenty of dialogue and scrolls explaining things to get the gist of everything, even if you aren't super familiar with Elder Scrolls. The walls of text and long conversations do drag things a bit, but it's not like everyone speaks in an encyclopedia like in Morrowind just so you can find out what anything is. Problem is, is that for a game that's part of a series known for its extensive lore, it's so... It's significant, even for a spin-off. Other than a few Deidre characters and level realms showing up in later games, the Battlespire itself is never mentioned after this. Because, spoilers, it gets closed off because having a training facility in Oblivion wasn't a great idea, so there's barely any connection to the series. Sure, you hear about Jagar Tharn in the intro, but all that really does is tie this game near the end of Arena timeline-wise, and that his betrayal was basically letting Deidre invade the Battlespire in order to return a favor to Dagon for helping out with his plan of taking the Imperial Throne. Plus, he didn't mind the battle mages there getting killed since it gets rid of competition for his position of head battle mage. You never see Tharn here since he's busy masquerading as the Emperor, so he doesn't even do the deed himself. He just has some other traitor sorcerer do it on his behalf. So because of that, any other mention of Tharn you do see in the game might as well just be, Jagar Tharn was here. What are here are mostly Deidre characters, and plenty of them. And while this is the most extensive focus on the Deidre in the series at the time, You'll quickly discover a couple things that undermine them as an opposing force and wonder how they managed to actually be one in Oblivion. For one, they can be pretty easy to bluff, to where I question if they have poor eyesight or judgment if I can easily convince them that I am on their side at times. And two, there is a lot of infighting between the different factions of Deidre, which, sure, that checks out for any demonic legion and can work in your favor. But it's when you hear the middle management bickering between them all that it gets pretty tiring. My patience was already pretty strained just trying to play through the game, so that didn't help with trying to listen to all these long-winded conversations to make me care all that much. What I did care about was getting to the end, and I could just sum it up as needing to get the Dagon, stop him, save the day, and go back home. But there is more to it than that. So I may as well go through what goes on in the game. 
I would say spoiler warning, but I don't think it's worth playing this to see what happens, so proceed at your own discretion. The first level is the Weir Gate, where Dagon has placed a sigil barrier on the gateway that prevents anyone from leaving to warn Tamriel. It's here you'll encounter this old crusty ass wizard named Clarentavius Valicius, who is the chief artificer and sole battle mage still alive. He managed to convince the Daedra, not hard to do, that he was already bound by them and calls us useless when he finds out there isn't any reinforcements coming. Useless! Useless! All is lost! So he tells us to go to task the last anchor holding the battle spire in place to destroy it in the void, which you can actually do to get a bad ending that may as well be the real one. However, we discovered there is a magic transport called the Star Galley that can take us to another part of the battle spire, but the cogs needed to operate the door to it were removed by another battle mage who also foiled the DHR beforehand and hit him throughout the level before being slain. On top of needing to collect the cogs, you'll need to reconnect the anchors, and Clarentavius won't be convinced of you using the Star Gallery until you get a pauldron off of a Daedra commander named Mentats, I mean Methats, and will give you his Typhosophia staff that protects the user from Daedra mental attacks. Now, getting to Dagon to stop him from invading Tamriel and evading the Battle Spire would be enough to go after, but there is another reason to press on. You'll come across notes left by an apparent partner of yours that went ahead of you for their test just as things got bad. Either Joshua and Cade if you're playing as a female, or Fatasha Trenil if male. The only purposes of this character are to provide a bread trail for the player and force a backstory element of making them an acquaintance of ours to care about rescuing. It's also a bit confusing since we were sent in sometime after, maybe we were scheduled to teleport in later, because in an archive Ellis Girl's website page for Battlespire, it said that we're apparently an Imperial agent sent to investigate the Battlespire after a lack of communication from our friend who was also an agent? that was sent in first to check the battle spire and didn't report back. That sort of thing is never mentioned in the game, as far as I can tell. Did whoever write this for the site misinterpret that, or is this some kind of retcon? Because the premise that we're just an apprentice expecting a test and thrown into this is fine by itself, why this inconsistent story synopsis for an official Elder Scrolls website? It's like when I found that weirdly extensive backstory Boombots had on their site. Then again, that is a game that probably the same amount of people played as battle spire, maybe even less, to care. Going back to the Weir Gate, opening the Star Gallery lets us go to the next level, but we can carefully go down a ledge before it to see the Mock Turtle, a large inanimate 3D model that speaks a wall of text at us referencing Alice in Wonderland and a password of his name backwards for... A shirt of precipitous travel. Uh, cool easter egg I guess? The second level is the administration area of the Battle Spire, where you need to find pieces of a Void Gate to continue on, which thankfully the Daedra Lord Samir Jibran wants us to do. There is also riddles you'll need to type the answers to, which were in the previous games too, except you find a scroll that just gives you the answers, so it kind of defeats the purpose of those riddles. Along the way you'll encounter a few other danger characters, such as one who thinks we're our friend and offers a scroll about a mace called Scourge that banishes people into oblivion. Turns out it's because Kay put on disguise and convinced him to find information about it who the leader of the Spire Deidre, Wanshala Kirian, also wants for herself. She'll exchange Scourge for a Void piece, and once you do, she gets banished because it's the wielder of the mace that gets yeeted into the Void when used. It was at this point I knew the Deidre weren't a threat here beyond throwing tough enemies at me. After pointing the Void God pieces, realizing I was still a messy one, got mad, and scoured the level for the last piece, I proceeded to the next level, which was the Soul Chiron, a place full of ghosts and race, the latter which are difficult to take out though you are able to find a book that gives you a ritual to say to banish them without a fight, so you can pretty much just do this once you're able to. Piss off, ghost! This area's MacGuffins are pieces of a control rod needed to open the next area, which you learn from one of these... gem guys called the Ideal Masters. They mostly spout nonsense about not wanting to be disturbed and wanting us to die to complete some ritual, but one does give us info about where the control rods are and how to use them. Eventually, you'll have to swim to get the things, and it's as janky as you would imagine, particularly when you carry too much stuff that weighs you down and you sink to the bottom. There is also a boat you can ride across some water. That's all it does. I'm sure the devs were proud that they were able to get working boats into this game back then, but it really is just a boat. It's around here you'll encounter a wraith that reveals to be the traitor that let the Deidre into the Battle Spire, being promised to escape in War Tamriel to become a hero, only to be double-crossed by another battle mage that masterminded the whole ordeal on behalf of Tharn. In other words, Dagar ordered Tharn, who ordered a loyal battle mage, who ordered a gullible apprentice battle mage into the invasion of the Battle Spire. This is reaching Star Wars Episode 2 levels of villains chain ordering subordinates for their scheme, and with that exposition, we get the control rods and go to the fourth level, the Shade Perilous. Here, the arbitrary things to activate are floor levers scattered about, and these sets of Daedric's textiles you need to press a letter of a word with. You'll also come across Deanira Catrice, 
a nocturnal Deidre held prisoner by the elemental Deidre. She explains that her mistress and ruler of the Shape Perilous, Jaseel Morgan, put herself into a semi-catonic state of despair after the seducer sided with Dagon and let him take over the area. And if you do try to talk with her, you'll quickly discover she's in far too deep to be of any help. I rise through sorrow. I sink with hope. The night binds me in tiny steps. Yeah, she definitely doomed scroll too much while on Twitter. Deranira feels responsible for convincing her to let Dagon into the realm, so she offers to be banished in order to snap Jaseel out of her doom and gloom state. Once we do, Jaseel will give us a phrase to use where we need to go, as well as telling us that we can call her for help once we face Dagon as payback for betraying her. Now, doing all that was the easy part. The hard part is dealing with all the dark seducers in this level. Not to be confused with the regular seducers, which turn invisible and I legitimately thought I glitched into a wall the first time I fought one. The Dark Seducers are one of the most difficult enemies to deal with in this game. Not only do they hit hard and have a lot of health, they throw spells rapidly at you in case you thought this game would ever give you a break. I had a miserable time trying to deal with these throughout the game as I only had so many arrows to try and take them out from a safe distance, and while I did get a resistance spell, it only works on one type of magic set at a time. Which is fine when dealing with enemies with only one type of spell like the Fire and Ice Deidre, but enemies like Dark Seducers will hurl every type of spell at you at once, making magic resistance only partially effective at best. There are other spells to deal with these, such as Spell Absorption or Reflection, but I didn't have those as spells, only as potions, so I limit myself to using them since there's only so many to find. And even then, some of them only have a chance to deflect or resist spells, because haha number rolls go burr. So after slowly taking out the Dark Seducers with arrows and hoping I had enough shield spells to land sword hits whenever I ran out of those, I eventually finished the level. Up next is the fifth level with the safe killing bug, the Chimera of Desolation. Here, you're being hunted by an invincible Hern Deidre for sport, so you're pretty much just running away from him for most of the level. But he's no Mr. X or Nemesis, so he's pretty easy to avoid. We learn how to kill him from this even older and crustier guy named Old Man Kamir who has been by himself in this realm for so long that he forgets how to talk at first. He eventually explains that we need the Spear of Bitter Mercy to take up the Hearn, as well as pieces of the Savior's hide. Armor that he used to protect himself from Dagon when banishing him before, but got punished with forever living and aging on his home island that got sent into this realm, all the while being tormented by the voices of the killed inhabitants. Dang, that's some actual backstory for this guy. I would appreciate moments like this if it didn't just come across as part of a single-player D&D campaign. Anyway, he also tells us that Dagon has a protonemic, an incantation name, but has a neonemic part of the name that we have to learn in order to banish him with a complete nemic. In addition, we also need six gate keys to exit the level. At this point, this is just a grocery list of things we need to get. I will say that this is the most fleshed out area with a lot to explore. If only exploring was any fun in this game. Though you do get a hot air balloon to ride around in, which is where I crashed the game after reaching the top of a building and attempting to enter it. After dealing with the Hearn and getting the armor and keys, we move on to the 6th level, the Havoc Willhead. Our main goal of this area is to learn the Neonemic of Dagon and get to where he is. Thankfully, this realm is pretty straightforward compared to the last, though this was where I fell through the level, which came about when going for loot in these pools of water, one of which was a trap you can't get out unless you use a teleport anchor beforehand that a sign mockingly tells us if you fall for it. Thanks, now I can add asshole game design to this too. Speaking of that, there's also a couple of scamps here with an absurd amount of health that I can only guess the devs thought it'd be funny to throw in here. Eventually you'll find Sirin Angada the middleman trader responsible for all of this. He's just there to explain that and casually mentions that Tharn is posing as the Emperor. You can either kill him or spare him. Either choice doesn't matter. A more useful character you run into is Grand Vizier Imago Storm, the Deidre clan leader of the Dremora, who gives us the neonymics of not only Dagon, but also Friedra and Zillavai, two other clan leaders in this level. He does so because he's just about as sick as I am over all the infighting between the Deidre and gives us one of three gate keys we need to exit the level. The other two keys are, of course, from Fiedra and Zillify, which we threaten with their neonymics and get deals for not only the keys, but immunities from their respective Deidre clans. A little late at this point in the game for that, but whatever, let's get to the end game already. The last level is Dagon's Hunting Lodge in a precarious area overlooking some lava. It was this level where the music didn't play, by the way. It kinda made things anticlimactic, but at this point I didn't care as I was getting close to finishing this game. Though with this being the final area of the game, it's not going to be easy. 
navigating isn't too much of a problem. Just need to get through a door with the lieutenant's name here, cross a lava gap with a crossbolt rope there. But it's when you get close to the palace, you have to deal with not only dark seducers, but the just about equally, if not worse, Deja Lords that also hit hard, take forever to kill, and spam spells. Even with the helmet I found that resists magic attacks and all my items and spells at my disposal, it was the most agonizing part for me. After painstakingly taking out enemies one by one, saving and restarting constantly, I make it to the palace with sheer persistence. There's a dark seducer that is Dagon's bodyguard, who will need its sword of the Moon River that is also required to banish Dagon on top of his Nymek. You think that's enough crap we need to take out the final boss? This really is a D&D campaign the devs made into an Elder Scrolls game, isn't it? So after all that, we finally get to Dagon doing his best girl for Mortal Kombat impression, who also has our friend held captive. Oh right, at one point they get captured and taken by Dagon too. Lure us, I suppose? Anyway, talk to Dagon once you have the hide of the savior armor and sword equipped and he does his villainous speech and we're like, Oh yeah, we have your armor, your full Nymek, and this super awesome sword we took from your bodyguard lover. And he's like, whatever, you still can't hit me. And then we call on Jaseel, who distracts him by... standing there. I stab him in the dick and successfully banish Dagon into oblivion. We then save our friend and escape the battle spire. And the game just hard closes after that. Unless that was a crash, I wouldn't put it past this game if it did. So that's the end of the game, and you think, that's it, time to wrap up this review finally, but nope! There's still one more thing to talk about. I know this is my longest review yet, but if I'm going to be thorough, you're going to be long for this ride no matter how long it takes. That being said, let's talk about the multiplayer. Yes, this game has that. Granted, it's online multiplayer where the software needed for it died years ago, but it is still possible to do so with network programs like Kali or Hibachi. Naturally, the only person I knew I could do this with was Tiger Ichimaru, and we were able to get it working using Hamachi. Wait, it's there working! It is. It's there working! Is. There are three modes of multiplayer, first of which is Deathmatch, the standard player versus player mode where you pick the map, including all the levels from the main game, you adjust the round time and what the point and kill goals will be, then make your character that you use against others and ready up. And wait for everyone else that are still creating their characters. Once started, it's a free-for-all to get kills and points by attacking other players or enemies that just stand there on the deathmatch maps. I will say this, it does work, as much as PvP with old Elder Scrolls combat would anyway. Though the other player's movement is pretty jittery, but that could be from the Hamachi connection. And it's... kind of fun? And I don't mean that in a cathartic way to extract revenge on Tiger for making me play this game. What would give you that idea? Another way to play is cooperatively in the game levels. So yes, you can effectively play through the main game with others. But even with being able to split up and take care of things faster, it still takes a long time to go through levels since they're huge. Lastly, there's Team vs. Team, where, as the name suggests, are team matches. I didn't play these with Tiger, but you are able to play by yourself, so I could at least check out the maps since I noticed there were Capture the Flag maps. Yes, an Elder Scrolls game has a Capture the Flag mode. That's just wild to me. While it is kind of neat to see online multiplayer in a game 17 years before Elder Scrolls Online, it's pretty obvious this was tacked on with the rise of online computer deathmatch games. I can see the versus mode being fun for a bit against others and would only do cooperative if anyone wanted to share the pain of the main game. Of course, you would need to find people that actually have the game to play with. You can have up to 8 players, but I wonder if that many people even played this online when it launched. Though I imagine it's still more players than Babylon's Fall. Ha <laughs> uh, Easy joke, I know. I don't think I've ever played a game that fought this hard against me. From the unfairness of the skill check fighting and tough enemies, to the arbitrarily long and padded levels, to being such a functional nightmare that I was afraid the game was going to fall apart on me at any moment. I can see the potential in the level-based structure for a more condensed Elder Scrolls game. Even though it felt like an entry to play through, it is still shorter than any mainline entry. Only from the purest objectivity can I say that this isn't the worst dungeon crawler I've played. That honor goes to Stonekeep Bones of the Ancestors on WiiWare, which also has the worst motion controls I've ever experienced. I don't think I want to get to this one anytime soon for a video, so you can check out my friend SCXCR's video on it if you want further elaboration. With Battlespire, it's the haphazard execution that makes it clear it was hastily made to get out there for the holidays that year and cash in on Daggerfall's moderate success, which didn't sell all that well anyway. Probably didn't help that Quake 2 came out around the same time, which is what most people with cable gaming PCs bought and deathmatched on instead. I wholeheartedly do not recommend this game unless you are somehow able to tolerate everything it throws at you. It is on Google Games and Steam for an affordable price at the very least. Oh, and don't believe the quote-unquote positive reception on the Steam page. It's mostly because of joke reviews. Even for checking out the older Elder Scrolls, I wouldn't bother with this one. 
Hell, Arena and Daggerfall, while pretty old and not super easy to jump into, are much better experiences and are free to download and play. Back when I bought Battlespire, the GOG versions of those were included for free, so there was that. And then there's Daggerfall Unity, a community-made conversion of Daggerfall in the Unity engine. And the latest version of that just got on GOG as a free download with preset mods. So just play this for your classic Elder Scrolls fix instead. Even with all the recent doings of Bethesda, I think we can all agree that they weren't too proud with Battlespire and that they did learn after this in Redguard not doing so well. After all, Morrowind came out and the rest is history. Sure, Elder Scrolls 6 won't be out for a long while since they're doing Starfield first, and even with Bethesda being bought out by Microsoft, which is now only the second biggest buyout they've made, I don't think the series, or even Bethesda, will ever get as low as Battlespire. Maybe my bar of standards is skewed thanks to this game, but whenever Starfield or Elder Scrolls 6 launches with whatever glitches and issues that people will laugh at, I'm just gonna say it's not as bad as Battlespire, and it never will be. Because broken games nowadays at least have a chance to get patches and such to get better, which does bring up the argument of releasing unfinished games that rely on those after, but games like Battlespire stay broken, even if it was patched, and I doubt it'll ever be fixed or get a unique version, because certain games are better left forgotten. Then again, the Zelda CDI games got fan remasters, so who knows. Okay, now we're done with Battlespire, and good riddance, the best part was finally being done with it. So thank you very much for waiting very patiently for this video, and I will see you all in the next <laughs> Really? We're still doing this in 2022? <sighs> Alright, uh, oh no, the game is attacking me because I didn't like it. Uh, Alright, let's just get this over with. Huh? thing okay uh. <laughs> What... what happened? Where am I? Wait... Oh no... Oh no! No 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 no! Curse you, Bethesda!